Church is that um, kind of repository for all the information that we try to push everybody back to that site to get as much visibility as possible. Definitely. All right, any other questions, comments? Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm pleased to hear about the uh, staff level meeting today with uh, uh, other stakeholders, WMATA and uh, supervisors, staff, presumably. Um, yeah. Uh, without going into the detail of that meeting, uh, anything, you know, going forward from the meeting you had today, is there any thought of regular check-ins or what's our plan of, you know, continuing contact? Yeah, I think regular communication is, is key. So I think just keeping the different parties abreast of what's going on, um, it was good to have everyone in the room for, for today to actually share information for in person for, I think, the first time in a while. Um, to kind of get everyone's plans out there and, and what's going on and what's what the process is. And so I think it's very important that at a staff level, folks are connected, that we also have some sort of a regular check-in um, with the county supervisors. Yeah, that's, that's right. Our last really big regional meeting on the project was about a year ago. And since then, we've had smaller one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, but it's good to get everybody in the room together. And in this meeting, um, I think the, the commitment was that we'll, we'll continue to do that. Obviously, our, our planning is getting to, you know, starting to gel um, in terms of the concrete steps we're taking. And um, it's really important that all of our neighbors are, are um, well informed and have a chance to weigh in on these as well. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hardy? Um, I have a comment and then a suggestion. So I thought the revamp of Choose Falls Church um, looks great. So I'm glad to see that we're using the website as kind of the clearinghouse for all sources of information. Um, so back when it was launched, I guess maybe two years ago, we were talking about making sure there were just basic analytics on the site. Yeah. And so I'd want to make sure that we're leveraging the analytics and understanding whether we are driving more traffic and whether people are clicking through certain pages, spending more time in certain places, just so we know the information that's being sought and how much interest we're actually driving to that website. Got it, definitely. Mr. Z. Thank you, Mayor. I am uh, really pleased that you're here, Mr. Goldstein, and that uh, there's so much synergy uh, between your efforts and uh, uh, others on council, in particular, uh, Mr. Lickenhouse, uh, whose skill sets uh, bring a lot to this game. And um, uh, I'm really pleased to see the efforts, uh, both the written materials as well as other uh, activities that uh, uh, contribute to uh, getting the word out. Um, and along with getting the word out, I just uh, want to remind uh, you that uh, uh, Moody's has just issued a 21-page uh, white paper uh, where they say that uh, the rankings uh, for bond ratings of uh, municipalities going forward uh, will depend largely on what they uh, do with regard to climate change and resilience, resilience being such an important part of this uh, for economic sustainability. Um, not just for the, the sheer virtue of, uh, of environmental sustainability. Um, I think it's another way of Moody saying that, uh, you know, they're not so much interested in uh, subsidizing the past but investing in the future. So I think yep. all of us need to be mindful about uh, those kinds of things. And also, um, there is a, there's a, there's a panel discussion this, uh, this Thursday evening. Uh, it's been well publicized already. Yep. Uh, we'll have people from um, NVRC, COG, and, and um, the media as well. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know whether this was mentioned in today's meeting, but uh, it would be great if we could have some of our neighbors there as well. It, um, we are getting the word out to our neighbors, and um, uh, that event is, is, as you noted, Thursday, February 15th from 7 till 9 p.m., um, and it will be a panel discussion on resilient, uh, sustainable development. And um, there's really a, a great uh, list of speakers and experts that will be on that panel. And uh, this is uh, being put forward by the Environmental Sustainability Council. And uh, uh, so that will, um, I think, be a very useful event. Thank you. All right. Anything else? If not, thank you very much. We look forward to your continued efforts. Thank you. All right, Mr. Shields, let's uh, move on. If Anything? I could just brag on uh, Mr. Goldstein, he's been uh, learning a lot and uh, really getting up to street speed and v helping us a great deal on this project, so it's great having him on our team. He also got up this morning at uh, the wee hours to fly back from Boston, so I know it's been a long day for him, uh, so thank you for being here tonight. So the uh, agenda, uh, 
Are we ready for the next item on the I think we are. Let's do it. Yeah. We don't want to keep him up too late. So <laughs> I think he already left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the um, so what we have uh, for on tonight's agenda for a public hearing is the draft of the request for conceptual proposals uh, pursuant to the Public Private Education Facilities and Infrastructure Act. Uh, for the West Falls Church Economic Development Project on approximately 10 acres of land adjacent to a new George Mason High School. So this document, for those who are in the room, is uh, on the back table if um, people would like to pick up a draft. And those who are watching online, if you just click on Granicus, you can take a look at the draft as well. Um, I'll just make a few notes on it. This, this draft was uh, initially put together by outside legal counsel, and then we have had a team who have worked through it, and that team has included uh, uh, city staff of uh, Carol McCoskery, uh, Jim Snyder, uh, Lee Goldstein, um, and uh, our outside consultants, Alvarez and Marcel, and uh, Bob Wolf. And so we're very thankful for all those who have uh, weighed in. The council looked at an original draft about a, a month ago and provided some initial comment on it. Um, we think we have a framework that is, uh, that is well organized and effective, but there are certainly points in the content uh, that we think uh, ought to have a good public review and public comment on before the target date of a March 1 issue. Uh, the goal is for the City Council to have a final draft at your meeting two weeks from today on uh, February 26 for the Council to consider uh, the authorization to issue uh, by way of a, a formal resolution. So just a couple notes on this, and, and City Attorney McCoskey can sort of jump in as well in terms of this basic orientation of this document. Um, the way it is organized is that it first, um, in Section 1, provides a, an overview of the broad goals and objectives of this solicitation. It lays out a vision. It provides some background. It, pr it provides a description of the zoning, uh, the transportation features of the site, and it lays out a preferred transaction process. And that's really just information uh, for those who, who would, uh, uh, for the development community that would want to participate in this process. For the community, I think Section 2 is a very important section. This is a section that lays out uh, the project requirements and the project's desired features. So first in section 2.1 is what the city would lay out. Of, here's what proposals will need to have um, uh, to be successful in, in this solicitation process. And then in section 2.2, it lays out um, some of the desired features that we recognize uh, might be subject to uh, negotiation or discussion with the development community, but we don't put those out um, as, as a clear marker of what the city is aiming to accomplish with this project. Um, section 3 lays out the procurement process and very, uh, it lays out the schedule in Section 3.2. Um, that, uh, that schedule lays out the uh, industry forum date. It lays out the date and the time frame for the short list, uh, the issuance of the request for detailed proposals, and then it lays out the, the schedule as it goes forward. Um, what the goal is is to have a top-ranked uh, developer selected by the city in uh, the fall of 2018, uh, targeted in October 2018. And at that point, the city then would enter into an exclusive rights agreement with that top-ranked developer. And uh, so what that would be is, is a commitment that that developer will adhere to the terms they've put forward in their request for detailed, uh, in, in their response to the detailed proposals. But it also the city would say, we're just going to negotiate with you um, to reach terms in a comprehensive agreement. Now, if that doesn't go well, then the city can end those discussions and then go to their second ranked uh, proposal. So it will remain a competitive process um, through that negotiation process because the city will, would, would have that option. Um, in that period of time between October and May of 2019, the intent is to finalize a comprehensive agreement and lay out a conceptual development plan that would then be folded into the zoning and the entitlements for the site. 
and uh, the council would then act on both the, the entitlements and the uh, comprehensive agreement in May of 2019. Um, from there, um, the, uh, the city would then issue bonds for the construction of the high school and uh, the, sc the school process is running, uh, the school design uh, process is running concurrently with, with the 10-acre the procurement process. And then over the two-year period of time where the school is actually being constructed, the developer would use that two-year period of time to obtain their site plan approvals, building permits, obtain their financing, et cetera, and then take possession of the property in the fall of 2021 after the new school is completed and occupied. So that's the schedule that's laid out in Section 3. Then Section uh, 4 lays out what the contents of uh, the proposals need to be. Um, section 5 lays out the evaluation process and the criteria. And then from there, uh, there's a whole host of uh, necessary legal uh, uh, language for the, for the procurement process, and I won't go through the details of those. Overall, the, the goal and the purpose of this first round of the solicitation is to identify uh, a short list of development teams that we think bring the greatest financial capacity and the best ideas and the best philosophy um, for how this land should be developed. And the phase two is where we'll ask for more detailed proposals um, which will flesh out that, that uh, the, the sort of broad uh, philosophy and approach of how they would take it, uh, take the, the property uh, and develop it um, um, through in, a, in, a, in a detailed way. In order to make sure that we can understand uh, the qualifications of the team that would be choosing, we do ask for conceptual development proposals. Now, we recognize that in this first phase they're early and they may change, but those conceptual plans will help us visualize uh, the philosophy uh, and sort of the, the approach that they would take to developing this property. Um, the, this first phase will also have uh, will not be will not include actual uh, valuation or proposals for what what they are willing to pay for the property, but we do ask them for how they would plan to finance it and and how they would calculate what the value would be. Um, so that's uh, an overview of the document, um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. And I would ask Ms. McCoskery if there are any key things that I left out that we should note in our in our staff report. No, the only thing that I would mention is that um, sections two, four, and five are essentially parallel. One is the goals and objectives, that's in section two. Section four is what is to be provided in terms of um, the information that the uh, proposers will give us. And then five is what we will evaluate, and we'll be evaluating based on our goals and objectives, et cetera. So those are parallel sections. Three is more the process of how we do our um, procurement and how we're going to move forward. Okay, so there's questions, so there are also comments. You welcome comments. Okay, well, why don't we see what we got. Mr. Z, you get that looking. <clears throat> <right. laughs> um, well, I, I think that uh, this is a very um, thorough and, and uh, uh, complex document. It needs to be read uh, more than once. Uh, uh, but one one thing just jumps out almost immediately at, uh, for me that uh, the planning commission had uh, stipulated an FAR um, uh, as a floor, and I'm wondering why uh, we did not include some indication of density in this uh, in this document when we've been so specific about other things. For example, a hotel. I, it, it's, oh, I'm sorry. I think it's as I said, it's a very complex document. <laughs> Thank you. All right, what else we got? Ms. Hardy? Um, so some, I guess, general questions and comments and then some more specific ones. Um, in general, um, other than us talking about it tonight and then coming up in the town hall, how are we going to get input? Do we plan to circulate this to the Planning Commission, the EDA, other boards and commissions, have a more thorough discussion in our um, town hall? What's the best way to kind of involve the public in this phase?
Well, the um, we we don't have a a real process intended to have sort of a granular walkthrough with all of our boards and commissions. Um, that's we haven't laid that out. Um, what we do want is to get it out so people can read it, ask questions about it, and and um, ultimately. Uh, get a point to where the council feels comfortable that the document does accurate, accurately reflect the consensus on what the goals and objectives are for this for this procurement process. So um, I don't have a real I, I can't say that we have a plan to go out and really kind of work it through in a micro way with with the different boards and commissions. And I don't know if our traditional board and commission review process is appropriate for this, but I think the point of it is to kind of have, have more eyeballs on this, right? So yeah. other than staff, and I know that we've enlisted outside help, but besides the seven of us, I'd like more input besides ours, especially for this first turn of it. I think it's important to kind of cast a wide net to get input to make sure we're heading in the right direction. While I think there's going to be a detailed RFP that goes out after this, that will be equally important. I think this first one is important to make sure that we are asking for the right things. And, the, and it's also kind of an expectation setting mm -hmm. exercise with the community so they know that, hey, this is what the council's thinking for those 10 acres. Are we are marching in the same direction? Because I don't think we want to be surprised with feedback in June when we announce a short list that uh, proposals may be different than what the community expects. So that's kind of my first comment and suggestion is just let's make sure we get uh, broader input on this beyond us. Um, second is one minor thing. I think we may be double counting the demolition of the school. So on page five, I believe this was in the school RFP as well. And I know that we've talked about before that it's also in the school RFP, but we just want to make sure that we keep that in mind whether we're going to discount the value we get here because we're asking them to demolish the school at some point we need to work out where it's going to happen I guess yeah you're you're right about that and we're consciously double counting at this point um, and I think when we have the developer in hand and the school builder in hand we're going to resolve that issue okay. but we need to have it on the table so it's not an add-on later on okay. um, and then in the financial requirements section where we talk about the structure of payments um, I thought we were being a bit prescriptive in and I think it's a careful balance between, again, expectation setting with the development community of how we expect to be paid and that we expect to be paid on a certain schedule, but prescribing that, you know, for example, 25% of the value um, at comprehensive agreement execution should be paid. I, I know that that's what we're modeling, but I want to make sure that that's realistic and we may want to, I guess, open it up to something, to other ideas, I think is my point. Is that I don't think we want to lay out a number like that, even though that's what we're financially modeling. If there may be a structure that developers may come to us that may be more favorable to us from a long-term perspective. So I don't want to put that in there necessarily because it may just leave them with, oh, that's their expectation, and they may not come to us with another structure. And that may be a good lens to apply on other parts of this, where, again, we may have an expectation that we want to be paid a certain way or we're expecting development a certain way, but if, they, if it precludes them from proposing a more creative and maybe a more beneficial solution, um, I don't want them to exclude those ideas. I think that's a good point, and in, in, in the proposal section of it, we do explicitly ask for them to provide some alternative ways um, that might be beneficial to the city, um, but it's not in that upfront section that you cite. It is more emphatic that this is how we're expecting it yeah, to be. Yeah, 25% so jumps out at you. Yeah, so okay. uh, I think we can work that section a little right. bit more. Um, and then two other points. Um, I don't know whether this is the right place to include points like this, but in terms, we've talked a lot, Mr. Lickenhouse has advocated for kind of the special taxing district. Is this a place where we should talk about that as an expectation, that this might be the context that you're you know, proposing development in, is that we may have a special taxing district on the, in this part of town? Again, I don't know whether that's appropriate or not, but I thought I'd throw that in there. Um, as well as um, some sort of lead designation that that's you know, along with the other list of requirements that we normally ask for, like affordable housing, should lead be one of those things that is a baseline expectation. I mean, there is there is mentioned leads, and they're a high level yeah. of lead yeah. score. It just doesn't say a specific it say score. Silver or gold or it just says a high yeah. level or something like that. I'll leave it up to Mr. Z and others to advocate for that. But that's it for now for my first turn. Thank you. All right. What else we got? Mr. Lichtenhaus. Thank you. Um, so I would, uh, uh, there's a couple comments that I want to reiterate um, that Ms. Hardy pointed out. The first is the public comment, and um, I'm not sure about the right way to go about doing that, but uh, I definitely want to make sure folks feel like they've uh, had the ability to comment. I know that there are some individuals here in the audience as well as other people that um, 
have a tremendous amount of expertise in real estate and real estate development out there that have a vested interest in this, and I would certainly want to solicit their comments. Uh, I'm not sure if it's um, advertising through the Falls Church News Press that the RFP is out. We welcome email response or reply, and you can even give them Mr. Mr. Goldstein's email. I'm just kidding. Probably won't do that to you. But uh, a place for them to respond with written comments. Um, there's, some, there's some folks out there that I've personally received comments from under the council has as well. They've been very thoughtful, uh, written out in, in great detail. Uh, I would feel much more comfortable if we had um, the ability to solicit that in writing uh, from folks. It doesn't have to necessarily go through all the boards and commissions, but I at least want to give some folks out in the uh, community that have that experience the, the, the opportunity to comment on this. Um, Second, uh, related to, to LEED, um, we do have high level LEED standard written out and identified uh, in section 2.1, bottom of page five. I think that we should, I think we should specify uh, if it's important uh, as part of the values that we expect a minimum of gold um, because high level LEED standard can be somewhat subjective. Uh, I would like to give developers the, uh, um, the, the due credit to think that they would assume that that's gold or higher, but I, I think that uh, as a city, if the expectation for a project like this is gold or higher, that we start uh, at gold. Um, also, as it relates to uh, the payment mechanism, I was confused reading through this uh, when comparing some of the expectations Ms. Hardy mentioned in talking about the 25 percent, and there was discussion over fee simple versus ground lease, and if you look specifically at um, if you look at specifically at section 2.2, I guess that's it's not a uh, numbered page seven. You get down to number B and it talks about retention of fee simple ownership of the site through a structure such as a long-term ground lease, but then we get to section 2.1 around uh, B and sub A and points B and it talks about that 25%. And then it talks about paying the remaining land value upon conveyance of the site, um, but doesn't necessarily specify ground lease. So I think we need to be very clear here um, if we are giving people the flexibility, which I think that we should. Um, I think we should lay out the preference, be very clear, only mention it one way, but provide the flexibility. I also have concern um, specifying, you know, 25% of the land value paid up front. And there was also some discussion uh, in a budget and finance meeting about an expectation that we would receive uh, three large chunks of payment. Uh, and that was incorporated into the budget, and I know that it may have just been a reversion value, expecting a ground lease and the accounting mechanics associated with that. But I want us to be very clear in terms of the expectation that, you know, we would prefer a ground lease, which it looks like that's the way that this document has been read. And I know Alvarez and Marcel have indicated that they think that we should get an upfront payment and then it should be a ground lease. Um, so if, if that is the intent and that is the council's will and the city's will, we should lay that out specifically. Uh, but I would also say, given the complexity of this and the fact that you do have uh, adjacent land owned by other parties that in some way could potentially be part of this overall deal for a developer that bids on this site, that we allow them to come to us uh, with, you know, creative ways of paying for this. And I don't mean creative ways of, of getting less money, but meaning if they want to pay all up front, if they want to extend that, whatever the value of it is, over a 10-year period as opposed to a 99-year ground lease, which is typical in commercial real estate, that we provide that flexibility. So enough specifics to make sure that we give them the guidance, but enough flexibility and not too many guardrails to where they may uh, contribute an idea, a creative idea that we haven't thought of in the larger context of a much greater phase development on that site as well. <clears throat> Just right, a look. couple couple more comments. Oh, cool. Mayor Charter, sure. I apologize. Okay. Um, I think it's important in a couple areas in, uh, here, specifically uh, in uh, Section 2.2 on uh, Letter C, provide Metro Accessible Class A. I would like to also add or trophy office space. Um, class A would be indicative of trophy space, but I think that it kind of sets the tone for the expectation that we want this to be, you know, truly an exceptional project. And trophy indicates the highest quality, highest level of expectation of office space. So we could say class A or trophy office space. Um, one more comments here. One second. In section 5.3 on numbered page 17, under proposer's qualifications and experience, 
Under letter C where it says mixed use development experience, um, I would like to add the word innovative and it may seem trivial to some, but I, I would like for developers to approach this project and anywhere else we can list the word innovative uh, in this conceptual design. I want people to think of this project and developers to think about this project other than just a plain vanilla mixed use, to think of this as truly an exceptional innovative opportunity. So in terms of the RFQ and the qualifications, I, I want developers to put their best foot forward and show us that they have done an innovative mixed-use development project, not just a mixed-use development project. So in my mind, even though this is our first phase one RFP, this is about setting the tone and the expectations uh, and what we would like to see. Mr. Lichtenhaus, is there any way of capturing your thoughts in some other manner than me scribbling over this document? I've got them written down here for you, highlighted. I'll pass them down. All right, thanks. I'll catch up with the city manager after to make sure that we get everything captured. Excellent, thank you. Mr. Duncan? Uh, I'm not as well-schooled in this document as several of you are, obviously. So I'm sorry if my questions are a little basic, but I just wanted to, and maybe you can tell me what page this information is on, but I understand this is about the economic development project on the 10 acres, right? But is there language in here that speaks to, you know, the coordination between this and the schools? I mean, I know there are other documents that line up the two calendars and show, you know, what what the economic development side's doing while the schools are doing their thing. I don't I don't see that same calendar in here. Is it important to have it here? Are we just assuming that anybody who picks this document up is going to do the economic development is going to also know what's going on with the schools, or is that handled also of uh, the business of dealing with you know the other stakeholders, which we of course take for granted, WMATA and the county and VDOT and all that, is that, is that explicitly laid out here or does it need to be? Well, the background in Section 1.2 does tell the story mm -hmm. um, about the relationship with the schools and Section 2.1 where the development requirements are listed on page 5. Item B states as a requirement is the coordination with the city school board and school administration on the utilities, roads, and infrastructure that will serve both the school parcel and the site, and coordinating on the design aesthetic of the site as it interfaces with the school parcel. That's a, um, a reference that I think is responsive to your question. Uh, we, I think we can try to keep our focus on that. We may be making some assumptions or presumptions that the development community is aware of the situation, but we want to make sure that that's clear. Yeah, that's I, all I'm trying to say, I guess. I mean, we're all, well, you all are very deep into this, but I just want to make sure that, you know, an item that's three lines in a multi-page document is based on what I hear you all talking about, very, very important. You know, the coordination is very important, and citizens certainly, you know, ask very basic questions like, are we going to go ahead and build this thing, even this high school, even if there is no economic development or if there's a delay in the economic development? And, <coughs> You know, whoever gets the contract needs to be able to answer that. I think. Okay, other comments? Vice Mayor Connolly? My comment is similar to Mr. Duncan's comment, and that is I think it needs to be more than just this section B here on line five to even say to work in conjunction with the architecture team for the school. Um, in the school's RFP, they required that there be a commercial architect on the team, and I don't think we need to require that there be a school architect on the team, but I think we need to note that that will require working in conjunction with another team on a next door project that's going to... And I don't know where that would fit, but I think that's important to mention. Other comments? Mr. Snyder? Thanks very much. I appreciate all the other comments made by council, particularly uh, a comment made by Council Member Litkenhouse. Um, at least in my view, I'm, I'm not interested in a lot of sort of these 
80, 90 percent residential, 10 percent commercial projects. I think the term innovative begins to, to get at that. I wonder, Mr. Mayor, if we could work in somehow an awareness of where technology is going to take us in the future, both with regard to transportation and, and um, other elements. And finally, do we leave enough leeway here for what in football is called the Hail Mary, uh, that is someone who comes in with a project that is so extraordinary that they can be seriously considered even though it may be totally different from what we've thought of so far. Is that a possibility here still? So first of all, the technology question, is that embedded anywhere in, in, um, in not just building a development for today but a development for the next 20 years where we're going to see significant changes? Um, and then secondly, just the, your judgment about whether we're also able to consider um, an unexpected uh, project, um, you know, something like a, a major uh, corporate interest or something. Well, I would just say that in the marketing and in the outreach, we are certainly trying to attract that. Now, I think a good fair read of this document could be, are we messaging that enough and I, th I think that's a good thing for us to keep in mind as we're reading this document. It certainly does not uh, presume any types of mixes. Uh, it, you know, whatever it, it speaks to uh, the development, it, you know, it refers to commercial first, it refers to the office, the, the hotel, the retail first and the re residential um, afterwards, but the, you know, it is envisioned to be mixed use. Um, as, the, as expressed in this document. Well, but I, l let me just add, I think Section 2.2 does a pretty good job of laying out what I think our expectations are, as does the brochure. Um, I, I hope we don't water down any of those. But I am, I am asking the other question, <coughs> two questions really. Have we put in there the notion, and, and it's really teeing off Council Member Litkenhouse, the notion that we're looking for um, something that isn't just built for today, but it's built for 20 years from now. Um, in terms of understanding both energy and, and other technological possibilities. And then the related question as to whether we're not so uh, prescriptive here that we are gonna discourage somebody who's got a really different idea from what we've seen here. At least coming in and you know initially being part of the competition. I think those are good points, and I think we'll just need to review it with, with those, that, those thoughts in mind. The, um, you know, what is, what is, I think, really helpful is the phone calls we're making and the, the meetings that we're having as we're trying to make sure that the development community is aware that this is coming. And we're getting a lot of ideas and feedback on ideas that we hadn't thought of just in those conversations. So I think this process is going to bring those out, and I think it's going to be really exciting when we're reviewing these proposals. We've been looking at this site ourselves for three years or so now, um, and it's going to be exciting to see what the market, uh, you know, in a, when we have, a, I think, a much broader participation than we did, um, than we've had before, to see the ideas that come forward. We certainly are inviting that. Okay, and, and then one other point, and I think it was underscored uh, today, the importance of cooperation with the surrounding um, jurisdictions and metro. Thanks. Mr. C. So a process question then. Um, uh, I'm reminded that uh, some of the citizens in the city have already asked that question. Uh, uh, who does this go to? Uh, and uh, so there is a coordinating committee, and, and uh, uh, I was un under the impression that it would get sent to the coordinating committee, but that's kind of an unwieldy kind of way of, way of doing this. Does it go to uh, you, city manager, uh, Mr. Goldstein, city clerk? Does it go to somebody someplace and with copies to other people? If, do you have a notional idea of how this should proceed over the course of the next two weeks? Well, it does need to be a disciplined process. Um, 
There needs to be kind of a, a tight group of people who are working through every detail so that if an idea is put in in section two, it really needs to follow through in section four and section five. Um, and it needs to be sort of a maintenance of control over the document. Um, so I think our task is, is to take that input and to take, you know, to try to have a, a structure where we're getting good, thoughtful and meaningful input um, but then it has to, it does have to run through a discipline process so that the document itself remains coherent and concise and, and a, you know, saying, making sure it's not contradicting itself in different parts and things like that. That's maybe not... A so it gets sent to you. Yes. So I, the, um, w I think that anything that goes to Mr. Goldstein, he is a point of contact on that. He's going to make sure that it gets to... Uh, the team of Alvarez and Marcel, Bob Wolf, Carol McCoskery, um, and myself, who are working through the details of this document. So it goes to Mr. Goldstein? Yes. All right, people at home. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Goldstein's email address is L. Goldstein, and the rest is at the City Falls Church site. That's right. Vice Mayor Connolly. So is this going to go up on the city website as a for people to comment on? How are we going to get this out there? Well, um, I already asked that question, but how, how are we going to do that? Because it's different than most stuff. Is it just? I mean, yeah. can it just go on the city website? Here's the draft RFP. If you, if it, you it's up on the city. Yeah, and here's the comment box, and yep. it'll go to Mr. Goldstein. Or. I will say, uh, you know, for the professionals who advise us, they think that that's just a crazy process. Um, but we understand, you know, we've been pushing them to say that we really do want this to be an open process. The, the key thing is, is to take the input and then run it through a discipline process. Everything, every idea that comes to it is, is not going to make it in this document. That's just, the, people need to understand that, the rules up front. Um, but we do think that the document will benefit from more eyes on it. And so where it is right now is on the agenda for this meeting. Um, and that's the only place online where, where it is currently located. Um, I think after this discussion with the council, uh, we'll have a quick huddle in terms of how we're going to choreograph or, or sort of have a process for, for input. Uh, the EDA and the Planning Commission in particular, I think, are two that, that actually among all the boards and commissions that are going to want to comment on it, and we just need to think about how we're going to handle that. Um, and I would also like to request that it get sent to the school board. Yes. I don't know that they will have any comments, but I think <coughs> as a courtesy and because we're working together on this, they should see where we are in the process. Yeah, Dr. Noonan has gotten a copy, and, but we'll be sitting down with him to, um, and anybody else that, you know, from the school administration that, um, before the, the coordinating committee to just go through this with them. Ms. Hardy. Just on that point, I just want to make sure that, again, that we cast the net wide because I do think that this is kind of a two-way thing. It's both to solicit input from the community, but also the expectation setting of what we are looking for on the site. So again, I don't want the community to be surprised when they think, you know, we may get the Hail Mary types of proposals that come through, that's the all commercial, you know, new headquarters for X, Y, and Z company. But in reality, we may also get a bunch of mixed-use projects, and I want to make sure people understand that that could be what we get. So I think putting this out there for broad community consumption is important for that. Okay, I've got a few comments, if I might. Um, starting on page one, um, I don't know whether this Roman numeral, or the, the one, um, the numeral one, is considered sort of an executive summary. I think it's too jargony for me to think of it as an executive summary. I would like to just see or give some consideration to some kind of plain English two-paragraph executive summary so that someone can pick it up and not look at PPEA and a lot of state code sections and just really understand in a couple paragraphs what it is our intent is here, what we're expecting from them in some broad terms. I think it's something to consider. I have a couple more specific comments on page one. The last sentence of paragraph two where it says, in a way that will maximize competition. I'm not sure how that works with the rest of the sentence. I really was perplexed when I saw that. Um, and maybe I'm just not reading it the right way, but that, that last phrase, in a way that oh, this project is intended to activate the parcel and generate both upfront and long-term revenue to fund the construction of a high school in a way that will maximize competition. I'm not sure what that means. Anyway, just if you could 
maybe I'm just not reading it right. <clears throat> in section 1.1, about two-thirds of the way down, we talk about catalyzing redevelopment by adjacent landowners. I think we need to make it really clear that we're looking for catalyzing adjacent false church landowners. Um, you know, what other jurisdictions might want or desire within the boundaries of, uh, you know, of their locality is really up to them. And so our goal is to catalyze false church development and, and not, uh, again, in the affairs of our neighbors with respect to development. So I think we need to make it very clear that we're only looking to catalyze false church development. Um, a couple other comments. Uh, we may want to list the on top of page three, we talk about being on WMATA offering rail service. We may want to put what rail line um, that we're offering service on. As far as the development requirements on page five, um, one thing I think to consider putting as a requirement is creating a sense of place, um, which I think goes a little bit beyond what we're talking about, some of the nuts and bolts of it, but I, I think having the idea of of making uh, place making creating a sense of place is something really important at least to me for this 10 acres and if we do not i think it's kind of a missed opportunity um i also um, we make mention of affordable housing at six percent at 60 percent ami so we're starting to allude to some of the proper requirements we're going to have but we give some but not all and so i think we need to give co some consideration either both how we say this you know there are, it could be for example we expect our standard proffer package which includes blah, 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 blah. So at least put people on notice that there's an expectation beyond affordable housing. And I don't know if we've given consideration this group or others about, for example, school capital cost. Is there an expectation someone might make a contribution to school capital cost? If so, that could be a multi-million dollar contribution. And so I think it's important we set the expectations up front. People are gonna run pro formas on this project. They're probably gonna be calling everybody. What, is, what are they expecting? What are they expecting? I think we ought to just put it in here if there are expectations for certain things, particularly multi-million dollar proffer expectations, we ought to put them here, uh, I think, in, in this document. And at a minimum, I think we need to allude to, quote, a standard pa proffer package or something like that so that people know that it's more than just 6% affordable housing. I think we should also put the number of years. We've got 6% at 60%. We don't list the number of years as well, and I, I believe 20%, 20 years is my recollection, uh, but I think we ought to put that in there as well. But anyway, so I think we need to put a little bit more about what our expectations are so people can run the numbers and do pro formas about um, how this project pencils out. Um, let's see what, I've, what else I've got here. Um, to me, the, the document talks about sort of short-term and long-term revenues, but it really doesn't get into the nuts and bolts of that, which I think are very important from our perspective and probably from a developer's perspective in terms of putting together a proposal and doing the analysis. And by that, um, I mean, for example, we're going to look at personal property taxes, but we're also going to look at sales taxes, hotel occupancy, transit occupancy taxes, b poll taxes. There's a whole package of things that we will look to for revenue generation. But that, I don't think, is apparent on the face of this document. And so I think it would be helpful to have a statement somewhere in here, preferably not at the very last page, that says <coughs> we're looking for revenue from you know, upfront fees and ground lease payments, but also um, taxes, you know, which include blah, 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 so that someone can do a proper analysis. For example, someone may think a hotel generates the same property taxes as an apartment, and therefore they're the same to us, which is entirely inaccurate. And we may also want to mention the city's fiscal model. You know, the city's going to be using our fiscal model to determine um, the long-term revenues or long-term um, tax yield associated with your project or whatever it might be. But uh, to me, a developer, if I was reading this as a developer, I would not get a sense that the tax yields are comprised of multiple revenue streams and that they are very important or as, um, or as important to us as this document lets on. So I think it would be good to have some kind of discussion about um, tax yield, et cetera, and how that, that breaks up and how that's an important component. Uh, let me see what else I've got. You know, I looked in towards the back, there's just a lot of requirements here, and maybe they all belong in here, but it seems to me like it's somewhat discouraging of having people um, put forth a proposal. Maybe it's all necessary, but it just read to me like a whole lot of things that someone needed to do. Uh, you know, have an engineer, you prepare this thing, prepare that thing. And uh, again, I don't know um, whether all of this is, is really necessary, but to the extent we can slim this down, I think we'll get more proposals. 
the extent the cost associated with doing a proposal goes down. So anyway, that's what I've got. Do we want to go ahead and open it up for public comment while people think if they have any more questions or comments? I'm going to go ahead and do that. So anyone uh, who wants to speak to this matter, you're certainly welcome to. Again, you'd fill out a speaker slip and you're welcome to, to make a comment. I've seen none. The matter is closed to the public. Are there any other comments people would like to make? Questions? Vice Mayor Conley? Uh, Mr. Shields, how close will this RFP be to the next level of RFP? Is the next one dependent on what we receive in this first set of responses? Or are we going to begin to work on that right away? Uh, we'll begin to work on the RFDP right away. Um, where you'll see the differences is in section four of the proposal contents and the evaluation criteria. Okay, is there any other comments or questions? If not, um, thank you very much for the work you've done so far. This is a great first start. We look forward to getting public comment and input from our community. Um, let's move on then to the next item. Madam Clerk, will you call the next item for us? TR 18-10 is a resolution appointing members of the Falls Church City Council to serve as representatives on the Affordable Housing Policy Work Group. Okay. Good evening. Hello again. Uh, quickly, this is uh, just to let you know that we're doing a update to the Affordable Housing Policy, which was adopted in 2013. So we have a regular five-year schedule that we do for the policy. So it's, it's time for our regular update. And so we'll be looking at a lot of items. Uh, we've been doing a lot of talk around affordable housing, maybe looking at you know, uh, numbers, revising some of the numbers as far as contributions and that sort of thing. And we have identified representatives that we want to be on our committee. I mean, our work group, and we would like to have a council representative and a alternate to serve on the policy work group as we have in the past. And so that's our request this evening. All right, thank you very much. Any questions, comments? And are you looking uh, for someone to be appointed at this meeting right now? Do we have anyone in mind, Ms. Hardy? So I believe uh, Ms. Connolly and Mr. Lickenhouse had agreed to serve as the members given that I'm the liaison. All right, is that, uh, is that true? That is in fact true. All right, sounds good. There were some bribes. What's that? There were some bribes involved. <laughs> okay, so do we... Um, uh, I just need to update this, this um, resolution then. All right, so... Default. All right, so does someone want to make a, a, make a motion? All right, we need a motion. Point so, of so line 56 is going to say council member Litkin House shall be council representative. And council member. And I'll be the alternate alternate representative. The other way around. But. The other way around. Is it the other <laughs> way around? Yeah, everyone agreed upon it. Didn't you get the message? <laughs> that, that is in fact true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. All right. So what do we get? Do so you want to make the? <coughs> you want to make the motion? Well, I, it says me in the motion, so someone else should. All right. I'll make a motion. To approve with that amended language on line 56. Is that right? And <clears throat> I'm going to suggest what the amendments might be that in line 56 you change the name Letty Hardy to Mary Beth Conley, and then in lines 57 through 58, change the name Mary Beth Conley to Ross Lickenhouse. I motion That's that. The I'll second that. Uh, before we go to a vote, um, do we have any comment? Any member of the public wish to speak to this? Seeing none, the matter is closed to the public. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you take the vote, please? Ms. Connolly? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Lickenhouse? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Z? Yes. Mayor Tarter? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you, Council. All right. Thanks much. Thank sure. you. Sure. Just Thank you, Vice Mayor Connolly and Mr. Lickenhouse. Uh, just as far as the procedures go on this, do the other appointees, lines 22 through 32, do they have to be approved by the council? Or is that just a... No. I, but my understanding is they do not need to be. Okay. Because the, the commission, my understanding is the commission already has the authority to appoint this work group, and we are just requesting a council representative to serve. 
All right. Thank you much. Let's move on to the next item. So TR 18-11 is a resolution to add an at-large representative to the Arts and Humanities Council of Falls Church. And since our city clerk is out, I'll attempt to <laughs> explain this. I think it's pretty straightforward. There are all the, um, the members are currently represented by specific organizations, so we're just asking to add an at-large general citizen representative to the membership of the group. All right. Okay, any questions about that? Of course you can. Um, I just want to point out that at the last Arts and Humanities Council meeting, uh, Ms. Prince and Ms. Heath attended that meeting and explained this to the members of the Arts and Humanities Council who voted yes to that this would be acceptable to them as well. All right. So do we have a motion? Uh, uh, Councilor, can I just make uh, at line 64 in the resolution, if you could in your motion replace the word at with the word add. So it's amended to add an at-large representative. All right. All right <clears throat> with that change, do so we have a motion? We are moved to adopt TR 18 dash 11 with the modification of line 64 to change the word at to add. All right, we have a second. Second. Okay, before we take a vote, any member of the public wish to speak to this matter? Seeing none, the matter is closed to the public. Madam Clerk. Ms. Connolly? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Lickenhouse? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Z? Yes. Mayor Tarter. Yes. Thank you. All right, let's keep moving. What do we have next? TR 18-12 is a resolution authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute a lease agreement with Jefferson 450 LLC for 959 gross square feet of office space for municipal use at 450 West Broad Street, suites 312 and 314 for a 10-month period at a rate of 1359 a month. Uh, Council, you mentioned this to us before, but why don't you do it one more time quickly? This, this is the last request for a uh, temporary lease to help with the relocation of staff while City Hall is under construction. This would be for the City's Criminal Investigations Division, and the request is, as, uh, as our Deputy Clerk noted, for a lease of 959 gross square feet at uh, 450 West Broad, a.k.a. the Panera Building. The total cost for this for 10 months is anticipated to be $13,585 uh, for a lease rate of $17 per square foot. Uh, the lease also is month to month, uh, which is, is helpful uh, to the city since it is a temporary situation. Uh, the funds for this uh, will be coming out of, actually out of the adopted operating budget for the police department uh, being paid for out of vacancy savings. All right, uh, are there any questions? <laughs> If not, do we have a motion? Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt TR 18-12. Okay, do we have a second? Second. All right, before we move on, is there any member of the public who wishes to address this matter? Seeing none, the matter is closed to the public. Madam Clerk. Ms. Connolly? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Lickenhouse? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Z? Yes. Mayor Tarter? Yes. Thank you, Council. All right, let's move on to the consent agenda items. Is there any item that anyone wishes to remove from the consent agenda? All right, you're supposed to read this, aren't you, Mr. Shields? Is that what it says here? I beg your pardon. So this is an um, item uh, to, to authorize the city manager on behalf of the city to sign agreements for tree removal and pruning services with JL Tree Service, Inc., and the Davy Tree Expert Company in amount of up to $90,000 per year uh, for up to four years, subject to annual appropriation by the City Council in the annual budget. Uh, this is a, um, a contract that we use both for emergency response and during uh, you know, major uh, debris pickup and cleanup, uh, as well as uh, regular tree maintenance of city trees, usually on the street, but also in parks. Okay, any questions or desire to remove this from consent? <clears throat> If not, does someone want to make a motion? Mayor, I move uh, approval of the item on consent. Okay, do we have a second? Second. All right, Madam Clerk. Ms. Connolly? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Lickenhouse? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Z? Yes. Mayor Tarter? 
Yes. Thank you, Council. All right. Any business not on the agenda? I've got something. Are the Christmas, are the uh, holiday lights going to be on, or are they on uh, pink or whatever? I've seen them briefly, but are they on every night? I have, I have not seen them, but I've been looking hard. <sighs> Apparently, we're ha we're having trouble with the red. Um, so it's uh, kind of the whole purpose, right? Yeah, <laughs> it is. So uh, let me get back with the council on the status. Then we got like two days, right? So <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Once you ride them hard, like I said, that's kind of the, the deal on red for Valentine's we're, Day. We're, we're trying to ride them hard. Yeah. All right. Okay, what else we got? Okay, if we have nothing else, how about standing and regional? Mr. Duncan, you had something. No, standing committees. All right, let's do it. Standing committees. Uh, the got? Economic Development Committee would, because of travel schedules, like to meet on Thursday, March the 1st, if the staff who likes to attend that meeting are available that morning instead of Thursday, February 22nd. Ms. Hardy and I have conversed about that schedule. Ms. Woodsman is, I think, available, so if you could just check your schedule. Mr. Mayor, and let us know if you'd be available Thursday morning, March the 1st. All right. Uh, Vice Mayor Conley, and then Mr. Uh, uh, Snyder. This is just a scheduling question for the Budget and Finance Committee. Because um, I think those meetings are going to start to conflict with the coordinating committee, right? Yeah, they. So we just need to f figure out when the coordinating committee meetings will be, or how they can work in tandem. Yeah. So I think we have avoided them, uh, if, yeah. and so we don't have a conflict in February, um, but we'll just keep an eye on it to make sure that those. Uh, Fridays don't coincide. Okay. I think we do have a conflict in February. Friday the 23rd. Okay. Is a conflict. Mm-hmm. Right. I thought we had tried, I thought we had worked around that. Is I thought we may have two, but. Yeah. Oh, this week? Okay. Budget meetings this week. Yeah. Budget <laughs> and finance is the third, <laughs> is the third Friday and coordinating committee is going to be the fourth Friday. Okay. And That's new news. I think. That is news to me. Very good. Yeah. Thank uh, you. That was the last, the last, the last meeting I went to. The budget finance was going to be kicked over into March, but this Friday? it was moved up. Well, it typically would be the third Friday, and, and uh, because the first of this month was a Friday, I think it's, it's, com it's coming at us quick. Whatever you think you're going to have, it's not happening this Friday. Cause I have someone. I have a 23rd meeting. Right. That's <laughs> all right. So all right, <laughs> we've got to too. we've got to sort that out. No, we're near. All right, let's sort that out this week and figure out. But you can't be there this Friday. No, I will be uh, California. Okay. That's serious. Can't be there. I think we need to have at least one meeting prior to March the twelfth. Yeah. While we're on this topic, this sort of falls under council member comments. But could I ask the budget and finance committee to consider the uh, communication that we received? At least I got you know, by email late this afternoon. I think from Mr. Sharp, uh, which speaks to many of the issues that we were talking about in our one-on-one -on -one meetings and weigh the concerns expressed and determine what is our appropriate response, if any. Sure. Thank you. I have no That's idea what you're talking about, but we'll figure I, it out. I, have, I <laughs> admittedly have not had a chance to read that I email. Just, I, so I said it came, I have not read the whole thing, but I, I recognize some of the concerns expressed are familiar. And uh, Okay. Am I correct, Ms. Hardy? I was saying we've gotten this comment from Mr. Sharp before. Yeah, right. And I don't believe that we've ever really, like, seriously addressed it point by point. It sounds ominous. It is ominous. Yeah. All right. What else we got, Mr. Snyder? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, just to ask that we set aside uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes in an upcoming work session to talk about the transportation funding situation in Richmond. The um, president today uh, apparently announced a infrastructure spending bill that would rely more on state and local funding of transportation projects. Our state has decided to pass that on to the localities. And so mm -hmm. I think we have to all be aware that there's a significant devolution of responsibility without a devolution of financing. And uh, it really is quite an amazing development that local governments are 
increasingly now being looked to at, from the federal and state levels to do everything. At the same time, of course, they, they cut the state and local tax deduction. So it would appear that there is a war on localities going on, and I think we just need to be aware of the potential financial consequences. Um, one other little tidbit, you uh, found this somewhat humorous. So last Thursday I was testifying in support of a transportation bill, particularly some statewide funding for transit systems all across the Commonwealth, and it took the Senate Finance Committee only 10 minutes to strike that financing and that provision. <laughs> so, so I had a delightful time there. But I will say this, that Senator Sasslaw is doing an excellent job of representing us and has really taken the lead on the transportation issues. Um, so that's where things sit right now. But I, I think people need to be aware of where it's going, um, what are the likely tax implications, and what is the likely implications on our um, budget. Very toxic environment there. Thanks. All right, any uh, Mr. Lichtenhaus? Yep. No, just a couple updates. Um, as liaison to the Library Board of Trustees, last meeting we had, there was a visioning session around the design related to the library actually very interesting meeting uh, I thought very positive one of the things that um, we did discuss briefly was tackling or attempting to tackle uh, the parking problem over there and I told them that uh, I would certainly make an effort to discuss with the city uh, ways that we can address that and um, looking at uh, the agreements with the adjacent building 313 Park Avenue the professional building um, and attempt to try to get that uh, figured out before uh, construction was underway. And then the second piece, a question for you, um, Mr. Shields. I was at the uh, Architectural Advisory Review Board uh, where we discussed the, um, the Aldi. And uh, there were questions over the consistency of the facade and working with the landlord. Um, they did not approve the project. Does that mean that it still comes in front of council without the approval? What are the next steps associated with that? Um, I, my assumption is is that it will, you know, there's certain things that the AAV does, which is, you know, signs. Yep. And so they're reviewing the sign package as well as the facade treatments. So they made, they didn't approve it at that meeting. I think the anticipation is that we'll come back and they, uh, there'll be additional information or a resubmittal okay. for the AAV to consider. And, and for the rest of the council, the essential issue is is that the Aldi facade was developed, but the rest of the shopping center didn't have any facade treatment changes. And so I think the comment was that will look unbalanced. Uh, let's talk with the landlord about getting a more complete look for the shopping center. Um, so that discussion, um, uh, yeah, it was a it was a it was a lengthy meeting, uh, but I thought it was important because the discussion over the uh, 2040 vision and keeping consistency amongst facades when there's renovations to existing buildings so it doesn't look like brand new half a building here and then whatever's left. So um, there was an urging to have them communicate with the landlord to, to try to work that out. And I would imagine that um, city staff will be involved in, in what that's going to take. So, All right. Any other council comments? Um, if not, Letty, okay. Sorry, it just reminded me when we were talking about standing uh, council liaison. So uh, EDA and Parks both met last week. Um, EDA is also, um, if we haven't heard already, very interested in all the work we're doing around parking. Um, so I think they're going to want to be involved with the staff work that's already underway. Um, Parks has an exciting development. I think their student liaisons are close to unveiling their please don't smoke in our park campaign. So given that we can't get state legislation to make it happen, they've designed some really cool posters that hopefully will go up around our parks, and so we can make it a big PR social thing, um, to let people know and see if that gets support for the next legislative session next year, which I think Delegate Simon said he'd be happy to carry legislation for us. So, Great. Any other comments? Uh, just very briefly, I know we all came away from the visiting session with things that we'd like to share, but the, when you mentioned the parks, uh, one concern that was expressed about the whether the Fellows property would be an appropriate park uh, from a member of Parks and Rec was they don't have any budget to program that space. They, therefore, I got the impression, have not weighed in on it because at the staff level they're not quite sure what they would be asked to do with it and with what money they would do that. So that's kind of a staff budget question, I guess, as much as anything. 
The, uh, in the capital improvements program that's being discussed with the Planning Commission, there is an item to uh, develop the pro um, to develop the park. The intent is for uh, along the lines that were discussed earlier, a fairly passive park design. It's not well suited for you know clearing and having a playing field on. It would be um, more in the nature of trails and, and other types of natural uses. Uh, so that's the concept that is being put into the capital improvements program. Okay, yeah. Mr. Snyder. Just a, a real quick one. Um, on the Saturday session, um, the request was made potentially for the boards and commissions to sort of do a little triage of their recommendations as to what might be accomplished quickly and at little cost. Is there any interest in pursuing that idea? Yeah, a technique that we would use is a sort of a, a chart that shows sort of on the x-axis level of effort and on the y-axis impact. And so the things that are low level of effort and high impact or low level of effort and reasonable impact, those are the ones that I think would meet your criteria. And we'll try to sort them that way. And uh, we'd love to have the board and commissions help in that. Okay. I want to move on to the approval of the minutes. Uh, does anyone have any comments or amendments or changes to the minutes? No, actually, yeah, I do. Um, it would be possible for roll call notes going forward that it um, accurately, ref accurately reflect my title from Miss to Mr.? Hmm. Absolutely not. <laughs> you ask so it happens much. the first like year. You when you get through this. It's understandable. When you get through the first year, you could do it. I, I figured it was hazing. <laughs> You got but I wanted to get that on the record. You got a problem with diversity? No. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. All right. Other than that, do we have any changes to the? Uh, uh, of course, Mr. Mayor. My weighty contribution is that let's try to spell fellows the same way all the way through. Uh, on lines 54 and 60, I think we have an E. I don't believe it has an E. And also same on line 122. And. So those are fellows issues. On line 153, I think the school had issues, not just an issue. And on line 186, uh, Ms. Litkenhouse uh, said an individual, not an individual. Mr. Litkenhouse said that too. And at the top of the page, uh, 201, I think there's just some words missing there about Ms. Hardy and what she's getting ready to say about eminent domain. That's all. I'd move approval of minutes as corrected. All right. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, this is, could probably be a voice vote, but why don't you just go ahead and call the um, roll call. Ms. Connolly? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Lickenhouse? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Z? Yes. Mayor Tarter? Yes. Thank you, Council. Is there anything else that needs to be said tonight? Other than we're adjourned. Mayor, move to adjourn.